This class on motor control starts out by looking at postural control. There's a good reason that we begin the class looking at posture. Effective postural control provides the scaffolding for effective action and effective perception. Postural control also has a significant impact on cognition. The content of this lecture is covered in Chapter 7 of the Shumway, Cook and Woolacott textbook. Let's start with some definitions of basic terms relevant to understanding postural control. The centre of mass, or the centre of gravity, as it's sometimes alternatively called, is the point at which the whole body, the mass of the whole body, can be said to be concentrated. In a standing adult, the centre of mass is located approximately a little anterior to the S2, the S2 vertebral level. The centre of pressure is the centre of the distribution of total force applied to the support surface. Lastly, the base of support, that we will sometimes abbreviate as BOS, is the area of the body that's in contact with the support surface. We will come back later to these terms. Postural control involves controlling the body's position in space for dual purposes. The first purpose is stability. Stability refers to the ability to, the ability to control the centre of mass in relationship to the base of support. Orientation refers to the ability to main, maintain a task-appropriate relationship between the segments of the body or between the body and the environment. A simple example of these dual purposes can be found uh, in what you're doing while watching this video. As you sit in your chair, you're regulating your posture to ensure that you do not fall out of your chair. You're, you're, you are also regulating your posture in order to maintain a steady orientation of your eyes relative to the screen so that you can understand the content of this video more easily. Here we see a person standing at a bus stop reading a book. They are standing comfortably with their feet shoulder width apart, and this is creating a good base of support. This person's centre of mass is located approximately at the position of the green dot. We see that if we were to draw a vertical line from the centre of mass down to the ground, that the line would fall inside of the base of support. This means that the stability requirements of the task, that is, of keeping the centre of mass within the base of support, are currently being satisfied. For this individual, the orientation requirements are to maintain a relationship, a steady relationship between the eyes and the book that allows the content of the pages to be seen and to be read. The balance of orientation and stability requirements vary with task. Here we see a goalkeeper attempting to stop a football from flying into the net. Keeping the center, keep the, for the goalkeeper, keeping the centre of mass of his body within the base of support is not relevant. All that matters is trying to orient the body so that the hand can reach the ball. In a, in a contrasting example here, here we see two construction workers walking along the steel I-beams of a skyscraper. Here the, uh, uh, here, the task of keeping the centre of mass of the body over the quite narrow base of support permitted by the I-beams are front and foremost in the constraints that matter. So here, the stability requirements are the most important. So what do orientation and stability requirements look like for tasks like walking or taking a step? First, in these tasks, the center of mass does not stay within the base of support. As you take a step forward, the center of mass moves out in front of the base of support provided by the stance limb. To prevent a fall, the foot that has stepped out needs to be placed ahead of the center of mass in order to create a new base of support. Consequently, in walking and taking a step, the base of support is being created on the fly. It's being created dynamically with each foot strike. The systems theory for postural control is motivated by the following assumptions. 
It assumes that there's no currently available universal definition of what postural control actually is. It assumes that there's no agreement in the literature between uh, on, on what the neural mechanisms that underlie the control of posture and balance exactly are. It assumes that, posture, that the control of posture emerges from the interaction of the individual, the task, and the environment. Lastly, it assumes that postural control involves a complex interaction of musculoskeletal and neural subsystems. The systems theory predicts that postural control emerges from the context of relevant constraints. Here we see a version of Shumway Cook and Woolacott's task individual environment model modified for specifically looking at balance. So in this model, we're, in, in this modified version, we're, see, we're focusing upon how effective balance emerges from the context of constraints that are relevant to balance. The, uh, the, uh, the relevant constra uh, uh, constraints of the task that we're looking at are going to be postural tasks. And these are going to include steady state balance, proactive balance, and reactive balance. We'll be going through these you know, over uh, the next, uh, next uh, video and a half. In the subsystems within the individual, we have uh, motor subsystems, sensory subsystems, and cognitive subsystems that are relevant to balance. Within the environment constraints, we have the support surface characteristics, sensory, co sensory context, and cognitive load that are each contributing to, uh, to uh, the, whether or not uh, balance is able to be stable and effective. We can take a more fine-grained look at the subsystems within the individual that are relevant to postural control. In the first part of our lectures on posture, we'll be looking at the motor constraints on uh, balance control. The motor constraints here in the, uh, in the expanded diagram are the musculoskeletal, the musculoskeletal constraints and the muscle synergies. We will then be looking at sensory systems and sensory organization, and finally we'll be looking at cognition. Synergies uh, is a technical term related to how the actions of muscles are coordinated. We'll be spending some time trying to understand this particular concept. We can look even closer at the subsystems systems within the individual. When we're talking about muscular stellar skeletal components, we're including in our discussion talking about joint range of motion, muscle properties, spinal flexibility, and intersegmental biomechanics. When we're talking about neural component in components, we're including in, in our discussion motor, pro uh, motor processes that act to organize the many degrees of freedom of the body into functional movement. We're talking about sensory processes such as the detection of information by various perceptual systems, and we're also talking about higher level cognitive processes. These higher level cognitive pro pro processes can, incl can include planning, anticipation, sensory motor integration, and the recruitment and selection of context appropriate information and synergies. A key prediction of the systems theory is that the form and functionality of balance will depend upon the interaction of multiple relevant constraints. This theory allows us to, uh, uh, allows us to appreciate not only the most obvious effects upon balance, but also some of the more subtle ones that we may not have otherwise considered. Let's look at an example of how a subtle, subtle change in the context of constraints can affect balance. We're going to look, like, uh, look at a study that was performed by Tom Stoffrigan. In the study, a person stands in a room and looks either at a near target or a far target. Two tasks were investigated in this experiment. The first, uh, the first task was a looking task. In this task, the participant either looks directly at the nearby small sheet of paper or further away at a larger sheet of paper. Basically, all that changes here in, in our manipulation of task is that the person is looking in front of them or at the wall uh, beyond the front target. The second task investigated was a searching task. In this task, 
a page of writing was placed in the, uh, on, the, uh, on the targets, and the participants had to scan through the text and count the frequency of particular letters. For example, the participant would look at the sheet of paper and be asked to count the number of times they saw the letter A. The effects of these two, uh, these two conditions in this experiment was considered by looking at the standard deviation of anterior posterior the, of the standard deviation of anterior posterior head sway. In other words, in this study, they looked at how much the head was swaying around. This then is a measure of how stable balance is. If you're standing more stably, your head will be swaying around less. What we find is that in the search task, shown in green, the head moves around less. Posture in this task is organized around stabilizing the head in order to support the visual system's ability to effectively scan the page. In the looking task, the head sways around a lot more. Also in the looking task, we see that, we, we, we see that changes in the direction of where we're looking at is making a big difference. When we look further away, our balance is more steady. We can see the effect in the looking task in more detail with this particular time series plot. On the y-axis of the graph, we have the head position measured in the anterior posterior direction. So as the, uh, uh, as the graph moves up, the person's, heading, uh, the, the person's head is swaying forwards, and as the graph mo mo moves down, the head is, sway the, the, the head is swaying, ba swaying backwards, swaying posteriorly. On the, uh, on the x-axis, we have time in seconds. Thus, in this graph, we can see how the head is swaying backwards and forwards over time. During the first 45 seconds, we can see the participant looking at the far target. We then see the participant switch to looking at the near target. Notice what happens here. Just by making the really simple change of changing where you're looking, we're seeing a dramatic increase in head sway. When the participant is looking at the far target, we see about one inch of sway. When the participant looks at the far target, we see, we see nearly three inches of movement. What we learnt on the previous slide is that quite subtle changes in the context of constraints can have pretty major effects on balance. Let's look at another example of how subtle constraints can have pretty profound effects on balance. Here we see a, uh, a picture of the power balance bracelet. According to the manufacturers, the bracelet uses holographic technology to resonate with and respond to the natural energy field of your body. The uh, idea of this bracelet is that just by putting on this bracelet, you can, you can see immediate improvements in your balance, strength, and flexibility. So just in case uh, you were not already wondering what I'm doing, uh, uh, what I was doing by telling you here, uh, but, uh, let me state definitively: this holographic, uh, this holographic technology is complete horseshit, and does absolutely nothing beyond a placebo effect at best. What I do want you to consider is the techniques that charlatans use to convince people that this particular device works. I've posted a video on, uh, on our channel that uh, I want you to watch. This video shows how subtle changes in how the, in the forces encountered by the body when the, power, the, when the power balance salesman pushes on you can make a dramatic difference between, the, uh, between you being able to balance stably and you not being able to balance at all. These subtle changes are barely perceptive, perceptually noticeable, and do a remarkably good job of convincing you that the bracelet is doing something quite magical. For the remainder of this lecture, we'll begin studying posture and balance in more detail. We'll do this by beginning to work through the various factors or sets of constraints that are highlighted in the systems framework. Let's start by looking at environmental constraints. The most basic environmental constraints on balance are the layout of surfaces. The layout of surfaces constrain the organization of muscles and the forces needed to regulate posture. If we consider the challenge of stepping down onto a hard surface like concrete, 
versus the task of stepping down onto a soft surface like grass. The grass has less impact on joints, but the, uh, uh, but the, uh, but the grass might also be less even and more unstable. The solid surfaces that surround us also provide opportunities for modifying our base of support by stepping onto them or grabbing or grabbing hold of them. The layout of surfaces also has a very different way of influencing balance. The surfaces that surround uh, that, uh, that, sur that surround us act to structure, act to create the perceptual information we detect that helps us to regulate posture. For example, sight of stable surrounding surfaces play an important role in maintaining balance. So when we were looking at the subtlety of the uh, or, or, uh, of constraints on postural control, and we saw that simply looking at one surface, looking at something nearby and in front of us, versus looking at a wall in the distance, what we saw is this had a quite dramatic change in how balance was being regulated. When it comes to the task constraints on balance, there are three types of postural control task. These include steady state balance, reactive balance, and proactive balance. Another word for proactive balance is anticipatory balance. Steady state balance concerns the ability to control posture in a fairly predictable and non-challenging set of circumstances. This includes activities such as standing, sitting, and walking in stable environments. Reactive balance concerns the ability to recover a stable posture following an unexpected perturbation. This might include situations like trying to re regain balance when you're pushed by someone, or when your feet slips out from underneath you when you're walking on ice. Lastly, Proactive balance concerns the ability to control balance in, an, in advance of potentially destabilizing voluntary movements, such, such as, for example, lifting up a heavy, bo a heavy box or holding a cup study while, a person, while you watch a person pour water into it. Today we're going to focus on steady state balance. We'll move on to reactive and anticipatory balance in future videos. We'll begin our consideration of steady state balance by looking at the relevant motor constraints. The first motor constraint to consider is the basic biomechanics of steady state balance. In the figure here, we can see the fundamental bi biomechanics of maintaining steady state balance. Maintaining balance here requires keeping the center of mass of the body within the base of support. The base of support in the figure is shown in red and is, uh, and is defined by the length of the foot. We can see the location of the center of mass marked with the turquoise dot. The turquoise line drawn vertically down and labeled W is the body weight force vector. This represents the pull of gravity on the mass of the body. Rotation of the body here is about the ankle joint, shown with the black dot. The fact that the body weight vector here is falling in front of the ankle joint means that the effect of gravity on the body is acting to pull the body forwards. A primary mechanism for maintaining steady state balance and for stopping the pull of gravity on the body from creating a forwards fall is the changing of ankle torque so as to move the location of the center of pressure under the feet. The center of pressure represents the mean location at which the forces of the body are acting upon the ground. We can see the ground, we can see the ground re reaction force vector in the dark blue and being labelled with the symbol R. This vector is equal and opposite to the force that the body is exerting into the ground. The origin of this ground reaction force vector is the location of the centre of pressure. The ground reaction force vector, vector captures the forces that are acting to oppose the destabilising effect of the body weight force vector. The ability to maintain an upright stance requires modulating ankle torque so as to create, so as to change the position of the ground reaction force vector and therefore create torques that oppose the effect of body weight. Changes in the location of the center of pressure therefore represent changes in the magnitude of the torque acting to counteract the destabilizing gravitational torque. 
The further the centre of pressure is in, uh, out in front of the ankles, the greater torque that's being created. The centre of pressure can only be located inside the base of support. This means that if the body weight, uh, the, the body weight force vector is out in front of the toes, and therefore outside of the base of support, that it will not be possible for the ground reaction force vector to be out in front in front of it in order to create an adequate counteracting stabilizing torque. In the situation we have depicted here, the body weight force vector falls within the base of support. This means that we're seeing a moment of stable balance. In the graph here, we see anterior posterior motion of the center of mass and the center of pressure during steady state balance. The movement of the center of mass back and forth represents the body starting to sway forwards and sway backwards. The center of pressure represents the change in the location of the forces acting under the feet to stop the body from falling out of control. When you look at the graph, you can see that as the center of mass moves in one direction, that the, CO, the center of pressure will run out in front of it to stop the body falling in that direction by creating a counteracting torque. Now that we've reviewed the biomechanics of steady state balance, we can gain a, gain a simple understanding of the importance of postural alignment. Let's start by looking at an unaligned posture. In this case, we have a, in the case we've got shown on the screen here, we have a forward lean. In an unaligned posture, a gravitational torque is created that's acting to destabilize the body. This torque is equal to the magnitude of the body weight force vector multiplied by the distance, the distance of the moment arm G. Acting to oppose the destabilizing effect of the gravitational, to uh, 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 gravitational torque is an ankle torque. The ankle torque is equal to the magnitude of the ground reaction force vector multiplied by the distance of the moment arm P. Remember, the moment arm P represents the distance between the rotation axis on the, uh, uh, in, in the ankle and the location of the center of pressure. Now let's look at an ideal of optimal alignment. In an ideal alignment, there will be no gravitational torque acting to destabilize the body. Gravitational torque will be zero. When, uh, and it'll be zero because the length of the moment arms G is going to be zero. In an ideal alignment, no angle torque is needed to maintain balance. Given that no angle torque is required in the ideal alignment, what we have here is a situation where the least amount of energy needs to be expended in order to maintain an upright, stable stance. Our consideration of the biomechanics of steady state balance so far is based upon a quite simple model of standing. By focusing upon the center of mass of the whole body, body as we've been doing in, uh, in the previous slides, what we've effectively been doing is looking at what we've been effectively doing is looking at a single segment model of balance, where we're thinking about the body as a whole being controlled around the ankle. In this simple model, the body is seen to be an inverted pendulum. This model effectively only has one degree of freedom. The head, the arms, the trunks and the legs are all treated as if they move as a single segment. This is not an unreasonable model of how posture is actually controlled, but in reality it only represents one particular type of control strategy. Other models of postural control have been proposed. These include two-segment models and multi-segmental models. In the two-segment model, we see posture being controlled by hip extension and flexion. We will look at this strategy in the next video. In the multi-segment model, we see multiple degrees of the free, or, or, degrees of freedom of the body, 
all throughout the kinematic chain, all being adjusted relative to each other in order to maintain balance. So a question that we would have is how complicated of a model do we actually need to understand postural control? This particular question is also relevant to understanding seated postural control. The essence of the question that's been asked here is how many degrees of freedom are being controlled in seated postural control? The most simple model is a one degree of freedom, a freedom model. This model assumes that the trunk is controlled as a single segment. We can also consider an alternative possibility with a model that has a larger number of degrees of freedom. So what we have here is a four degree of freedom model. In practice, the selection of a particular model, be it a one degree of freedom model or a four degree of freedom model, should be motivated by data that tells you if the assumptions that you have in the model are legitimate and are appropriate to the, to the particular situation that you're trying to understand. For example, Victor Santa Maria analyzed the seated reaching movements of children with cerebral palsy. Victor observed trunk motions that suggested that there were four segmental, zo segmental zones of control. In other words, the spinal flexibility that was ob observed during the studied reaching movements was consistent with there being four degrees of freedom being controlled. Let's look at the concept of base of support in more detail. Earlier we talked about the base of support being defined in relationship to the center of pressure. To recap, the center of pressure is the locus of forces that are directed by the body into the support surface. The base of support is the region of the body over which the center of pressure could theoretically be located. Here we see uh, a range of different st stances. On the left, we have a person standing with their feet side by side with a narrow base of support. In this particular way, in this particular stance, the base of support is the area under both, both feet and between the feet. In this stance, if I bear a lot of weight uh, of my body weight onto my right leg, the center of pressure will be located under my right foot. And if I dissipate my uh, dissipate uh, or if I distribute my weight evenly across both my legs, the center of pressure will be located in between my feet. Next, we see the base of support for standing in a comfortable stance while holding a walking stick. The black dot depicts the contact point of the walking stick in the ground. Here we, here we see that what we've done is create a new contact point with the ground that acts to extend the base of support. This new contact point means that if I'm falling forwards, I can put weight on the cane and potentially move my, my, my center of pressure out in front of my feet in order to stabilize my, uh, stabilize my body, something I wouldn't have been able to do if I wasn't holding the cane. Next, we have a very wide base of support. And we have a, uh, and then, uh, and then what we have on, in the last image is a person standing with one, one foot roughly in front of the other. As well as telling us where the center of pressure can be located, the base of support tells us where our center of mass can be located in order for it to be physically possible to remain balanced. Let's remind ourselves of the basic physics of static balance. Here we see a gray object resting on a surface. We see that the vertical projection of the object's center of mass is outside of its base of support. This means that there is this means that this object is unstable and is going to fall over. For the biomechanics of human standing, this means that if your center of mass falls outside of your base of support, you're going to start falling over. The base of support is related to our stability limits. Stability limits tell us how we can move our body without losing our balance. When the center of mass of the body falls outside of your base of support, your posture becomes unstable. In this case, you can either fall over or you can modify your base of support, for example, by taking a protective step. So a narrower base of support will narrow your stability limits. 
reduced stability limits will make it more likely that a protective step will be needed to maintain balance. Although the terms base of support and stability limits are related, they are not exactly the same. The concept of base of support concerns where the centre of mass can theoretically be located. In contrast, the, the, the concept of stability limits concerns where the centre of mass can be pragmatically located. Let's look at an example of a, per, of a person standing while, be, uh, while also supporting their balance with a walking stick. The blue and grey areas show us the base of support. The limit of, limit, limit, of the limit of stability is demarcated with the orange area that's inside the base of support. The limit of stability is the area where the centre of mass can realistically be located without a person losing their balance. For example, it's not practically possible for a person to have all of their weight on the walking stick. This means that while it's theoretically possible for the centre of mass to be located near the tip of the walking stick, it's not possible in practice. Here we see another example. On the right hand side, we see the consequences for balance for a person with a right-sided weakness. The right-sided weakness will reduce how much they're capable of loading their right side. This will reduce the regions that the center of mass can practically be located toward their uh, on their right side. So, the limits of stability gives us a more functional evaluation of how the center of mass can be moved around. And this definition can be used to be able to understand the consequences of individual differences, like differences in strength and, and differences in joint range of motion. A limitation of the concept of base of support is that it comes from static mechanics, the part of physics that's related to unmoving object or unmoving objects. Balance, in contrast, is not static. The body sways around, and our postural adjustments are quite dynamic. So, a benefit of the concept of limit of stability is that stability limits don't have to be de defined statically. Let's look at some examples to understand this, where we're incorporate the notion of dynamic balance. First, let's look at the static case, where we're defining whether a person is stable or unstable, purely based upon looking at the location of their centre of mass. Here, the green dot representing the vertical projection of the centre of, uh, of mass onto the ground is within the base of support. We can therefore say that what we have here is balance being in a stable state. Here we again see the centre of mass within its base of support. It's a little bit further forwards, but because it's within its base of support, we can say that we still have a stable balance state. Lastly, we have the centre of mass outside of the base of support, and we would define this as being unstable balance. Now let's think about defining the stability of balance more dynamically rather than statically. To do this, we will consider not only the location of the centre of mass, but also its speed and direction of movement. Here we see that the centre of mass is in the centre of the base of support. And based upon the, the, the green arrow, we can also see that it's, in, uh, that it's currently moving posteriorly. This seems to be a pretty stable configuration. Next, we see the centre of mass outside the base of support. This is a clearly unstable configuration. The last and most interesting case is this one. The centre of mass is located towards the front of the feet, and it's moving anteriorly. In this situation, even though the centre of mass is with inside of the base of support, it is still unstable. It's unstable because it's not just enough for the centre of pressure to be moved in front of the center of mass, it has to be far. It has to be far enough in front to overcome the effect of the inertia of the human body. So the fact that the body is swaying forwards means that the body should be it should be classified as being unstable. Here we see a figure 
that characterizes the limits of stability dynamically. On the y-axis, we have the velocity of the center of mass. On the x-axis, we have the position of the center of mass. The area of the graph that's shaded in red are those combinations of position and velocity on the axes of the graph that create unstable configurations. The areas of the graph that are shaded in white are the combinations of position and velocity that create a stable configuration. A stable configuration is one in which it's possible for the center of pressure to be moved out in front of the center of mass and to create a torque that can restabilize the body. So, if the combination of, uh, of center of mass position and center of mass velocity puts you in the red area, a protective step will be needed to increase the base of, su base of support and, the limiter and, 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 relatedly, the limit of stability. Here we see a configuration labeled where the center of mass is located within the base of support, and the center of mass is not moving. So we're at the zero on the uh, on the y-axis. Our velocity is zero. This falls within the white region and is therefore a stable state. Next, we see a configuration where the center of mass is in the same location, but the body is currently swaying forwards. This change of the body swaying forwards re 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 really fast moves us into the red zone and creates an unstable configuration. The concept of limits of stability is well suited to the systems theory. This is because it's a functional concept. We can incorp incorporate various aspects of the context of constraints that we discuss based upon the uh, ideas in the systems theory into the notion of stability limits. For example, st stability limits can also be defined as being affected by perceptual and cognitive factors, such as fear of falling and perception of, of, perception of safety. Here we see the stability limits for standing on level ground. These limits of stability cover much of the base of support, but notice they don't come right, uh, right up to the, edge, uh, to the edge of the base of support. For example, what we're seeing here is that the stability limits are not extending right out to the end of, of, uh, of our toes at the ends of, uh, ends of our shoes. This is because it's not possible for, uh, for us to, uh, to support the entire weight of our, uh, weight of our body so on the tips of our uh, on the tips of our toes, at least for most people. Next, we see a person standing on the edge of a cliff. Here, the base of support is unchanged because we're still standing on solid ground, but the limits of stability will be expected to be reduced by cognitive factors such as fear of falling and perception of safety. We just looked at the role of basic biomechanics as a constraint on the organization of postural control. Let's now begin to consider the role of more complex musculoskeletal mechanics. As we sway back and forth while standing, the tissues of the body are constantly changing in tension. This creates a dynamic network of forces that affects balance. In the case of muscles, muscle tone helps keep the body from collapsing in response to the pull of gravity. The term muscle tone refers to the force with which a muscle resists being lengthened. Muscle tone incorporates both background muscle tone and postural tone. Background muscle tone has passive and active components. The passive components of background muscle tone are related to the intrinsic stiffness and viscosity of the muscle tissues. The active components of background muscle tone include stretch reflexes. Postural tone involves the active recruitment of anti-gravity muscles. The active recruitment of anti-gravity muscles modulates the instantaneous stiffness and viscosity of the joints. This helps to shape the field of forces that keeps the body balanced. Various muscles in the body are tonically active during upright stance. That is, during upright stance, they're continuously tensioned. 
In the figure, we see some of the muscles that are frequently tonically active when a person is standing upright. In the figure here, we can uh, visually see how subtle changes in body posture alignment can affect muscle tone. Here we're seeing then how a subtle change in postural alignment can change which muscles are tonically active. For the last part of this lecture, I want us to start looking at postural control strategies. A strategy refers to a particular way of organizing the control of posture. Perhaps the simplest postural control strategy is the single segment ankle, ankle strategy. This strategy interprets the task of controlling posture as being similar to the task of balancing an inverted pendulum. Here we see a setup designed by Laram and Lakey. They use this setup in their, uh, uh, in, in, their, uh, in their research to investigate how the ankles could be used to control an inverted pendulum that had the same mass as the person's body. As modeled by Laram and Lakey, the single, the single segment ankle strategy has two components, a passive component and an active component. The passive component involves passive ankle stiffness. Here we see the passive resistance of ankle muscles and uh, b uh, b b uh, being stretched, um, acting to keep the pendulum held upright. We see this depicted with the body drawn as an inverted pendulum and springs around the ankle representing the tensioning of, ten uh, of t uh, tendons and muscles around the, an the ankle joint acting to stabilize it. The more dominant and active part of the uh, ankle strategy has been depicted by Laram and Lakey as a throw and catch strategy. On the left here we see the, the, the body is leaning forwards. We can visualize the pull of gravity on the body by imagining a ball on a hill. If the ball is, uh, if the ball is, is balanced exactly at the top of the hill, it will not have a tendency to fall either forwards or backwards. Here we see that the ball has started to roll down one side of the hill. This represents gravity acting on the mass of the body to accelerate it forwards. Now, if we move to the figure in there, the picture, the image in the middle, we see that the that, that we're having a torque generated at the ankle to effectively catch the falling body and throw it back up to the top of the hill. In the last image on the right, after the body body has been thrown back upright, a counter torque is developed to catch the body and to stop it from continuing to fall in the opposite direction. So this is the throw and catch mechanism. The next strategies to consider are two segment strategies. These involve hip and ankle rotation rather than just ankle rotation. Kreeth et al. analyzed the body sway of young adults who were simply asked to stand still. They observed that both ankle and hip strategies were contributing to the body sway. Kreeth et al. observed that there were two ways in which the movements of the hip and the ankle were coordinated, that there were two coordination patterns. The first pattern was an in-phase coordination pattern. In this pattern, when the hip flexes, the, uh, when the, hip flexes, the ankle dors dorsiflexes, and when the hip extends, the ankle plantar flexes. Thus, in this pattern, both hip and ankle act to move the body in the same direction at the same time. The second coordination pattern that was observed was an antiphase pattern. In this pattern, when the hip flexes, the ankle plantar flexes, and when the hip extends, the ankle dorsiflexes. This causes the pelvis to move anteriorly as the head moves posteriorly. The in-phase coordination pattern was classified by Kreef et al. as an ankle strategy, since all the parts of the body were swaying forwards and backwards at the same time. The antiphase coordination pattern was classified as a hip strategy, since in, the, in this movement the pelvis moves forwards and backwards relative to the feet and uh, relative to the feet and head. Kreeth observed that seeing an ankle strategy versus a hip strategy depended upon the frequency of sway. When sway oscillations were, so, uh, were slower, then an ankle strategy was observed. 
when the sway oscillations were faster, then a hip strategy was more likely to be observed. The strategies that are used during steady state balance are influenced by the available base of support and the associated lim limits of stability. Here we see a ballerina standing on point. In this case, the ballerina here has a very narrow base of support. In this case, only minimal movement of the center of, the, of, the center of mass is possible. Moreover, only tiny changes to the loca location of the center of pressure can be made in order to create stabilizing torques from the feet. In this case, center of mass location is most effectively adjusted by changing the posture of the body. In other words, uh, the ballerina could use a hip strategy or could use a strategy that involves shifting her center of mass around by moving her arms around. Next, we can look at the case of increased stability limits. Here, the skis that the man here is wearing dramatically increase the base of support. This means that the center of pressure location can be widely varied and large stabilizing angle torques can be, uh, can be generated. In this case, the center of mass location is most effectively adjusted by changing ankle torques, so an ankle strategy is most likely to be observed. Uh, we spent most of today looking at steady state balance. Next lecture, we'll pick up by looking at reactive and proactive balance.